So MP4 file will be posted to our webpage at the Alaska Fishery Science Center. This is the start of our seventh season and the first of nine weekly ground fish seminars running through December 13th. Since we are all doing this seminar remotely, the speaker will use an electronic pointer or be descriptive when indicating specific points on the slides. To help with this format and to avoid additional distractions, please mute your audio and turn off your video feed. Also, please keep your questions for the end of the seminar, or if you think you might forget them, please type them into the chat box and Liz, Bianca, Sarah, and I will compile them for the speaker. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind people to join us for next week's speaker, Jim Thorson from Heifer at the Alaska Fishery Science Center, and he will talk about the phylogenetic imputation of reproductive, behavioral, and morphometric traits and their use in joint species distribution models to understand community assembly. And that will be at the same time next Tuesday, October 11th. Today's speaker is Sabrina Beyer. She's from NIMS, the Sea Grant Population and Ecosystem Dynamics Fellow, and a PhD candidate in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Sabrina has been affiliated with the NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center Fisheries Ecology Division since 2009. She uses quantitative, empirical, and theoretical methods to study how spatial, spatiotemporal variation in ocean conditions influences the reproduction of marine fishes. Her work aims to improve biological information for West Coast groundfish stock assessments and to improve life history theory related to causes and consequences of variation in reproductive traits. So take it away, Sabrina. Great, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, well, first off, I'd like to thank Mark and Liz and Bianca and Sarah for putting together this uh, seminar series. Um, I'm so happy to be here today and to be talking about rockfishes and the California current ecosystem and reproduction. So thank you all for hosting this series. And before I start, I'd like to just acknowledge my PhD advisor, Suzanne Alonzo at UC Santa Cruz, as well as my NOAA mentors, John Field and Sue Sogard, that have been really, you know, developmental and instructive in, in, in putting together some of this work, or all of this work. So what I'm going to be talking about today are a couple chapters of my dissertation work uh, that I've done in partnership with uh, the NOAA Fisheries Lab in Santa Cruz. So what I'm going to do, let's see if I can advance this slide. It's a good question. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to the California current ecosystem because I know some of you may not work in the system and we're going to I'm going to set up kind of the groundwork on how the environment varies through time and through space in the California current. And then we're going to talk about reproductive traits of rock fishes and um, how they might be related. So here's the California current ecosystem. It's a, a current that runs from north to south along the US West Coast. It's broadly um, divided into three bi biogeographic regions of the southern region, central and northern region. And where we work, I thought I'd show you a picture of our lab. So we are here right on the north end of Monterey Bay. And so we're on the UC Santa Cruz uh, Coastal Science Campus. And so that houses the, the UCSC Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And then across the parking lot is the NOAA Fisheries Ecologies Division, um, which is great. So we have a great co collaborative working relationship there. Um, and because of this, mainly the rock fishes that I work on are these fishes that are found in the central and southern region. But we'll, we'll talk about the whole ecosystem today. Okay, so let's set up. So let's set up some of the groundwork for, for thinking about why reproductive traits may vary through time and through space. So in the California current ecosystem, we know that the conditions, they vary through time. So they vary year to year. And here what you're looking at is a graph of the North Pacific Gyre Oscillation Index. Um, it's essentially an index of ocean circulation patterns, but uh, positive values of the index correlate with better ocean productivity in the California current, so higher chlorophyll levels, better nutrients, and then negative values indicate kind of lower productivity conditions, and you can see how that changes through time. 
And some things that influences, you know, interannual variation in the environment are climate events such as El Nino that bring warm water, less productive waters into the ecosystem, or La Nina conditions that bring cooler waters to the system. The California current is also impacted by um, marine heat waves in the North Pacific. So year to year, the environment changes. And then in terms of spatial dynamics, so we have you know, influences through time on the entire ecosystem, but within the ecosystem, we have differences in the environment from north to south. And really, whatever ecosystem that you're that you're looking that you're working in, if you have differences in seasonality, you know, you might get some differences in ocean conditions that may be important to the life history of the species that you work on. So just broadly, as a general overview of how what conditions vary that I'm most interested in in terms of how they may affect reproduction are one temperature. So you can see temperatures are quite warm in the south and then they're cooler, especially along the coast where you have upwelling patterns in the central and then the northern regions. But you also have differences in seasonality and there's lots of ways to look at differences in seasonality. But one thing that really matters in the California current is seasonality and upwelling that drives primary and, pro and secondary productivity. So and when food is available. So in these central and northern regions, you get strong upwelling in the spring and the summer months, and then you can get downwelling that occurs in the fall and the, and the winter. And then in the south, the conditions overall, there is upwelling that occurs. But it's it's less and it's kind of it's more persistent through the year, but sort of weaker all overall. So in the in the in general, we think of conditions in the south to be somewhat less productive. Okay, so let's talk about fish. Um, so I could probably spend a whole seminar just talking about rock fishes, um, but I'll, I'll focus more on their reproductive biology today. So rock fishes are they're an incredibly diverse group. There's over a hundred species worldwide. Off the coast of California, there's a hot spot of diversity for these beautiful rock fishes. So there's over 65 species that occur, occur off the coast of California alone. They're important to recreational fisheries as well as commercial fisheries. And within the genus, there's some, some reproductive traits that are gonna be important uh, to talk about today. So in general, they're live bearers. So you can see this is an image of a day old rosy rockfish. They're very, very small. They're only about five to seven millimeters in length. And these fishes are actually highly fecund. So even though they're live bearers, they're highly fecund. And you see, this is a pregnant brown rockfish here and a pregnant um, vermilion rockfish here. And so you see their swollen abdomens and there's probably 500 to 700,000 little larvae in those broods um, that those, those fish are gestating. Some other aspects that are important to this talk are that rockfishes are moderate to long lived. So some of these species will live to about, you know, tens of years, but some can live over a hundred years. So you may have heard like the yellow eye rockfish will live over to a hundred years. And the species I'm going to be focusing on today are mainly the shelf species. So they, they also occur, you know, along the coast and off the slope, but today I'm going to be focusing mainly on these shelf species and they reproduce in the winter months. So they produce broods of larvae in the winter. And the cool thing about rockfishes is they're pretty well studied. We know quite a bit about them. And one of the um, life history uh, hypotheses that has come out of working with rockfishes is this idea that as these fish grow larger and they're very old, they're really important to population productivity. And this is called the Boff hypothesis. So this hypothesis that these big, old, fat, fecund female fish are really important to uh, reproduction in these species. We'll talk a little bit more about that throughout the talk. Okay, so let's get back to um, what may vary through time and through space in terms of reproduction. So in terms of temporal variation, we have some evidence that during El Nino years, um, those conditions reduce body condition of these females and gonad size, but we haven't quantified that. So we're gonna do that today. We're gonna quantify the differences in brood size through time for these you know, moderately long lived species. Okay, and then on the second half of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about spatial variation. And so what I'm talking about here is the frequency of how often these fish reproduce. So once they mature, most fish in the genus will produce a single brood of larvae per year. But in the south, where those conditions are different, there's at least 15 species, possibly more, that are capable of producing multiple broods a year. And what I mean by that is that they'll produce a brood of larvae, and then a couple months later, they'll develop and produce a new brood of larvae later on. Um, and within these 15 species, it's mainly the individuals that live in the south that are doing multiple broods just about every year. 
And then in the central region, sometimes we see it happening, sometimes we don't. And in the northern region, we have no evidence of multiple breeding. Um, if you have a fish that you see multiple broods in that is from the northern region, please let me know. Um, and then actually what happens in the north um, and even farther north up into Alaska is that some of these fish will actually skip spawn. So they'll be mature, but the energy dynamics are just not there and they won't reproduce in a year. But that's more to the north. So why does this matter? Um, so spatiotemporal variation of reproductive traits, it really hampers our efforts to assess population reproductive potential. And many of these species are managed as a coastwide stock, although there's a few assessments that are divided by region. But you know, this is going to matter in terms of how much these fish are reproducing through time and then through space. Okay, so the overall research question driving this research is what are the causes and consequences of reproductive plasticity? And what I mean by reproductive plasticity is that we see variation in reproductive traits but we think it's tied to the environment. And why that's important is that as the environment changes, you might expect reproduction to, or reproductive effort to change. And if we have, we can, if we can develop these relationships, maybe we can actually make predictions about, you know, what will happen in the future when the environment changes. So here is our, our, our working hypothesis for all of the research projects I've been a part of. So we have, you know, some idea that environmental conditions in the ocean influence primary secondary productivity. They influence prey dynamics for these rock fishes, which is gonna feed into really the per capita feeding success of these fishes. And that of course is gonna be influenced by density dependence and other you know, feeding success, foraging theory, all of that. But then once the female you know, consumes prey, consumes energy, we also want to know more about you know, how that energy is used, because that's gonna tell us you know, a little bit about how these fish should grow and how they should reproduce. So once energy is consumed, you know, some of it is needed to maintain bodily function and loss to metabolism. They use this energy to grow larger in size and some of these rockfishes get quite big because they are long lived. Um, and then also they're gonna use some of this energy to reproduce and reproduction is costly in a live buried species, right? They've gotta fertilize their broods and then they have you know, a, up to a month long gestation period and then they release those, those embryos into the wild or those larvae, I'm sorry, they're fully developed larvae at that time. And so while we study this, we have imperfect observations of these processes, right? So we have ocean indices, but they might not exactly tell us what's going on in the you know, local environment. We have, we wanna know something about the energy reserves of these females, how that changes through time. So we can uh, look at measures such as body condition, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Fulton's K condition factor, which is essentially, you know, how fat is this fish given its length? And then ultimately, what we'd love to know is more about reproductive success, but oftentimes we have more information on the reproductive output in terms of you know, no, the number of eggs produced per year or number of larvae released per year, and we can measure that in terms of, of brood sizes and fecundity. So if nothing else from this talk, if you take away this hypothesis that I hopefully I'm gonna show you some data that, that proves or that supports this hypothesis, is that environmental conditions really influence maternal energy reserves in rock fishes and any really capital breeding species that store energy throughout the year. And this is going to influence reproductive output and reproductive variation that we see. Okay, so here's the, the setup for the talk today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how and why does reproductive effort vary through time and then by region. And so as part of this dissertation work, I've used field, laboratory, and theory to, to tackle this question. And I'm gonna deviate a little bit from my abstract today. I am gonna talk about a field study with over 20 plus years of brood sizes for four rockfish sh uh, shelf species in Central California because it's an awesome example of how reproduction varies through time. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the laboratory study today, uh, but we do have a paper. If you're interested, you can just email me. And what we did in the lab is we wanted to know how water temperature and food rations would influence body condition in a species that's capable of multiple broods and then how that would influence reproductive effort. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that, but I'm not gonna focus on that today because I thought it would be interesting for this group to talk a little bit about my third chapter, which is developing life history theory to really explain and predict some of the variation, the spatial variation that uh, we see in these fishes. And I'm gonna you know, make this um, statement that seasonality really sets the timing and frequency of reproduction in rock fishes and maybe other species that are broadly distributed uh, by latitude. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and jump right in to our field study. And I would like to acknowledge my co-authors on this project. Um, it is not published yet, but it is currently in NOAA internal review. Um, so Sue Sogard and John Field are my NOAA mentors. Suzanne Alonzo is my PhD advisor. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues, Dave Stafford and Yosha Kashef, who are experts in staging of rockfishes. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge also my husband, Abel Rodriguez, who is a Bayesian statistician that helped me out with the stats on this project. Okay, so we are gonna look at four different species of shelf rockfishes in central California. So these are the yellowtail rockfish, the widow rockfish, the chili pepper, and the picaccio. And we are gonna use what we know, these imperfect observations of how the environment changes through time to see how we can correlate that with changes in body condition and then changes in fecundity of these fish and specifically brood sizes of these fish. Uh, so we're gonna use this North Pacific Gyro Oscillation Index. And we're gonna be working here in central California. Okay, so here is a map of our study site. So to focus in on this temporal variation, we collected fish from a single location in Central California through time. And we're gonna to add to these collections some historical data sets where fish were collected with the exact same methods at Cordell Bank, same species back in the 80s. So we were able to extend this time series from the 1980s all the way up to 2019, which is awesome. So the fish were collected right here at Cordell Bank. Um, it's this really cool, really productive seamount where all four species are highly abundant. Um, and we collect the, the yellowtail and the widow off the top of the bank, and then we collect the chili pepper and boccaccio kind of off the northern slope here. And to do this, we've worked with the fishing community. So we've uh, chartered uh, commercial passenger fishing vessels to go make collections by hook and line in the winter months when these fish are reproducing. Uh, we also have chartered small uh, commercial boats to help with these collections. And it's really the expertise of these um, anglers that are helping us to target these specific species during the winter months uh, to get this data, which has been you know, a really unique aspect of this project. Okay, so here's some more fun pictures of what we do when we bring fish back to the lab. So we take their morphometrics, and then here we're gonna use the Fulton's K body condition factor to assess differences in maternal condition through time. And that, so the equation for that is just weight over length cubed, and it's gonna be a proxy for differences in maternal energy reserves. And then we're gonna also correlate that or try to correlate that with brood sizes of fish. And so here is a chili pepper rockfish, and this is the gonad with probably, you know, 500,000 little eyed larvae in there. So we dissect the gonad, we take weighed subsamples uh, from females that have either unfertilized eggs or fertilized embryos. And then we actually count those eggs or larvae. And so here I've had so many students and I'm so grateful for their help. So they, they're sitting at microscopes counting eggs. Some of them eventually got sick of that, so they decided to develop and adapt new methods to actually image these eggs and count them quick, more quickly. Um, and we have a paper, um, this was one of my students, Haley Mapes, um, and, and that paper is currently in review about adapting the autodiametric fecundity method for rockfishes. Okay, so this is what our time series looks like in terms of sample sizes of fecundity data. So we have our four species um, from the 1980s all the way up to 2019. And I'll just, you know, be very explicit that we targeted the chili pepper and the yellowtail. So that's highlighted in yellow. And we have the largest sample sizes for chili pepper and yellow and yellowtail through time. Um, and then we decided to include data on the widow and the picaccio because they intermingle with those other species. So we get them occasionally and we thought, hey, let's take a look at what they're doing also. And then we were able to add this data to a master's thesis by Dave Stafford, who did work at Cordell Bank from 2005 to 2007. And then some information um, going back to 1986 of researchers from NOAA that um, had made similar collections out at Cordell Bank. So really cool, 20 plus years of fecundity data for brood sizes from a single location. Now, the one thing I should mention is there's differences in, we have examples of the two reproductive strategies here of rockfishes. So these yellowtail and widow, they are limited to a single brood of larvae every year. And so their brood size is equivalent to annual fecundity in those fishes. For chili pepper and boccaccio, they are capable of multiple brooding, but they don't usually do it in the South. Although we've seen some more evidence in recent years of multiple brooding in Central California. I'm sorry, they don't do it in Central California as often, but we've seen some more evidence of that in more recent years. 
So that is a little bit confusing and we can't quite address multiple brooding here, but we are gonna look at differences in brood sizes through time for both these single brooding species and species capable of multiple broods. Okay, so before we get kind of into the results, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this model and here's where size becomes really important. So if you plot log fecundity and log length of a female, um, this is gonna be the linear relationship that we're gonna work with. And some things to note is that uh, we're gonna look at differences in the intercept and also the slope. And that's gonna tell us about the strength of the maternal size effect. And what I mean by that is if you have a slope around three, you have this allometric relationship of fecundity and length, and that means that large fish and small fish, they all have about the same relative fecundity. So in terms of eggs produced per gram of, of female spawning biomass. However, in rock fishes and most marine fishes in general, this, this uh, fecundity increases at a faster rate with maternal length. And so you have a, a slope greater than three. And this has been termed a hyperallometric relationship. And what this means is that larger females will produce disproportionately more larvae, so greater relative fecundity in terms of eggs per gram of spawning biomass than small females. Okay, so this is really important to consider um, when you're looking at you know, differences through year, you have to always account for maternal size. Okay, and then just quickly, I'm gonna show you how we set up this model. Um, if you're not such a math person, I've kind of put a visual representation of the model over here. So again, it's a linear model. Um, we're looking at differences in the length of fecundity relationship through time. And those differences could change, right? The intercept could change. So fecundity could be lower for all fish in some years or higher for all fish in some years. But also you could have some interaction terms. So maybe in some years, the large females are really producing more eggs. Um, and so you, you'll see differences in this uh, fecundity length relationship through time. So more specifically, we're gonna use uh, Bayesian statistics with a hierarchical model. Um, and so this is kind of what the base model looks like. So we're looking at log fecundity of an individual fish in year J um, as a function of maternal length of that fish in, uh, in year J. And then we're gonna look at uh, the population level um, intercept parameter, which is alpha here, and then uh, the population level slope parameter, so telling us about the strength of maternal size effects, which is beta here. And then we're gonna model offsets. So really, year is a random effect in our model. And so we're gonna model offsets in those parameters by year. And the cool thing about doing a hierarchical model um, is setting up in a Bayesian framework is we're gonna model the hierarchy in the priors. So we're gonna assume that the alpha and beta, um, the population level parameters of the fecundity length relationship are drawn from a common distribution. And then from each year, those offsets that are added to, to the mean are gonna be modeled and they're gonna be drawn from this common distribution. And the cool thing about that is that years that you don't have a lot of data, uh, your estimate for the fecundity length relationship is gonna shrink more towards that population level mean. But years that you do have a lot of data and it's saying that yes, this relationship is very different, that's gonna come out in the model. Um, and so it just, to me, it's, it's a little peace of mind that's a little bit more conservative than say a model where you're modeling year as an independent variable. Um, so really, if you see differences, you know, it, it's because the data is telling you that there is a real difference. Um, and then some other information on the Bayesian framework, I'm happy to talk about this more later, but I'm gonna um, move on for now. And then from this base model where we're looking at length, um, we're gonna add in the effect of the environment, the MPGO, um, and then also a measure of body condition, so the Fulton's K, uh, and see how that influences fecundity. Okay, so here is, is our results, and I apologize, there's lots of dots on this, this screen, but um, these are dot charts, and they're a great way to look at differences through time. Um, so what I'm gonna walk you through what you're, what you're looking at. Okay, so on the x-axis, we have expected brood sizes for our different species, and then on the y-axis, we have time. And if there's no dots, we didn't have data for those years. Okay, and because you know, we're looking at size, we're looking at the expected fecundity for fish that are small, and we used a reference length of L50, which is the size at which 50% of females in the population spawn. And then we also have a reference length of 
L infinity, which is uh, the asymptotic length from von Britten Lampley growth curves. And these are coming from the most recent stock assessments for these species. So all you really need to know is green dots are small fish, purple dots are large fish, and then these orange dots are the mean size of fish that we collected in our samples. Okay, so how do you see variation in these plots? If you look up and down, you know, especially for these small fish, you're not going to see that much absolute variation in brood sizes, right? The broods are smaller, there's not as much variation. But for these large fishes, we find incredible variation in brood sizes, the expected brood size for an individual fish. And this is really dr uh, driven by differences in the maternal size effect, that slope. Um, and so I have the slopes pl plotted here, and this red line is an allometric relationship. Anything to the right is a hyperallometric relationship. But the really interesting thing is this relationship changes through time. Um, and that can drive really big differences in expected brood sizes for large fish. Okay, so how large are these differences that I'm talking about? I've listed them on the bottom here. And uh, for an example, a very large yellowtail rockfish would be uh, expected to produce a brood of 2.3 million larvae in 2017. But the next year was just a horrible year and they would be expected to produce only, you know, 770,000 larvae in that brood. The same size fish that is over 1.5 million fewer larvae from a large female, one large female rockfish um, by year. So a 67% decline. I think that is amazing. <laughs> um, and so we see, you know, all these, these species have different reproductive ecologies, they have different brood sizes in general. Um, but with the single brooding species, we do see, you know, fairly large declines or differences, interannual differences in reproductive effort. And then for the brood sizes of these multiple brooding capable species, it's not quite as, as, as large. And really what's probably happening there that maybe brood size doesn't fluctuate so much through time, but the capability to produce multiple broods would actually influence um, reproductive output and interannual variability, like just as strong as the single brooders um, through time. Okay, so what was interesting is that when we took a closer look at the effect of the environment and body condition, we found that the differences in slopes were this weak but positive correlation with summer and fall feeding conditions in the California current. So in years of good conditions, those large females are really, you know, putting all that they have into reproduction. So they're gaining lots of energy reserves from good feeding conditions and putting that into reproduction. And then in years where the conditions are not as great, they're, they're just not going to, you know, put as much into reproduction. And kind of thinking through the reasoning for this, you know, those small females at L infinite, at L50, they're still growing, right? So they're still, you know, making these allocation decisions between growth and reproduction, and they don't have the fat storage capabilities as those big, large females do. So it's really these big, large females taking advantage of those good conditions to really ramp up fecundity in good years. Okay, another example of that are these conditional plots of the full model. Um, I know this is also a little bit hard to take in all at once, um, but here you're looking at expected brood sizes for different size fish. I would recommend just maybe looking at these large females in purple, and then you're looking at how brood sizes is influenced by uh, the summer and fall feeding conditions, but also for fish that are in average body condition, in poor body condition, and then in good body condition. So you can really see the influence of body condition on expected brood size as well. So again, the takeaway is that these large females are really able to take advantage of those good ocean conditions. Okay, so here's the main takeaways from looking at 20 plus years of fecundity collections from Central California. We see strong interannual variation in the brood size for single brooding species, less interannual variation for these multiple broods, but we haven't been able to fully account for multiple brooding. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in the um, second half of this talk. And then also what I think we've learned is that phenotypic plasticity of brood sizes, along with the long lifespans of these fish, is likely adaptive to cope with these strong interannual environmental variability that occurs in the California current. And it's really these large females that are taking advantage of that. So why might this matter? Well, obviously population reproductive potential will vary strongly year to year, um, but the maternal length effect is also gonna be variable. And so, you know, if you have persistent poor conditions, you're probably going to have low productivity. But once you get those good conditions, if you have, you know, a lot of large females in your population, 
uh, they're going to be the ones to take advantage of those conditions and ramp up reproduction. And this is possibly, you know, part of why we're seeing some of these really strong year classes that occur. And implications for management, you know, fishing does remove or, or it, it, females just don't grow as big if there's a strong fishing pressure. So if you're re removing those large females from the population, you know, here's another example of where that um, might be sort of a bad thing. Okay. So hopefully I've convinced you that, you know, the environment is influencing fluctuations in maternal energy reserves with, that's influencing fluctuations in reproductive effort through time. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick drink of water, write down any questions for me, throw them in the chat, um, and then we're going to continue on to the second part of this talk. Okay, so we are going to shift gears a bit, quite a bit. Um, so we've talked a little bit about how reproductive effort varies through time, but now we're going to talk about spatial variation. Okay, and we're going to talk more about this multiple brooding, right? Because we didn't really answer that in our in our first first part of the talk. So I'm going to be talking today about state dependent life history theory that we've developed using rockfish bioenergetics models, and hopefully I'm going to convince you that actually seasonality in the environment sets the timing and frequency of reproduction for these fishes. Okay, so this work, um, it is being written up for my dissertation chapter, but it's not, you know, it's not quite ready for publication. I would love some feedback on this. Uh, project partners on this are John Field and Suzanne Alonzo, um, but also Mark Mangle. But we're going to use a stochastic dynamic programming model to look at this. He's written a couple of books on this um, and has helped me really you know, think about these models and how to develop them. As well as Chris Harvey from the, um, the NOAA Northwest Fishery Science Center, who has put together these awesome bioenergetics models for rockfishes that I've adapted for this model. Okay, so just as a review, a refresher, we have spatial variation in the environment. So kind of mean conditions differ through these three biogeographic ge regions of the California current. Okay, and we're gonna be focusing mainly on differences in temperature, seasonality, and ocean productivity. And this is influencing somehow, you know, the frequency of reproduction in these fishes. So again, in the north, we see really just single brooding species, potentially more species and females that skip spawn. In the central region, we have this mix of single and multiple brooding species. And then, you know, of those multiple brooding species, sometimes the females will produce multiple broods, sometimes they won't in the central region. And in the south is really where we have, you know, the, the species that are producing multiple broods, and then the individuals of those species are doing this pretty much every year. So why? Um, so some of the hypotheses are that the conditions in the South, these warmer temperatures, weaker seasonality, and lesser ocean productivity, you know, may influence why these fish down there are producing multiple broods and doing something so different. So, and just to show you kind of some differences that we've seen, this is um, a paper by Lindsay Lefebvre and others in our group looking at multiple brooding of chili pepper rockfish. And again, multiple brooding increases annual fecundity, right? So it's a whole nother reproductive effort of these fishes. It's also more common among large females. So again, a maternal size effect, the importance of those large females. And so what you're looking at is female length on the x-axis and the proportion of females that are predicted to multiple brood on the y-axis. And in the South, you know, it is mostly the larger females, but even smaller females are predicted to be multiple brooding. And then in the central region, I'll say this study was during a time where we saw lots of multiple brooding in the central region, but it was really the large females there that um, produce multiple broods. And if you were, we don't have any data from the North, but if you were to plot it, it'd probably be a straight line across the bottom with no multiple brooding. Okay, why is this happening? Okay, so to address this question, we developed state dependent life history theory model using stochastic dynamic programming and rockfish bioenergetics. And we're doing this to model adaptive variation in the frequency of reproduction, so single brooding, multiple brooding in rockfishes that live in different environmental conditions. We're doing this to explain, but also to predict spatial variation of reproductive traits. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how this model is set up, and then we're gonna talk about some of the cool results that came out of it. So how you, how you work with SDB models is you're usually modeling some aspect of energy dynamics. And so what we're gonna do is we are gonna model monthly energy dynamics of a rockfish from it, over its entire lifespan, okay? So monthly time steps over the entire lifespan. And this is what a month, what a month looks like in terms of how energy is gained and lost and allocated. So at the very start of the month, we're gonna know 
the female's length, and we're going to know the amount of energy that it has. When I talk about energy in the model, I'm specifically energy uh, modeling kilojoules of energy, but if that's confusing, just think of it, I'm modeling grams of fat <laughs> that these fish have, okay? So that's the simplest ex explanation. And if you want to be a little bit more specific, you know, grams of lipids that are stored in the liver, in the mesenteric fat, um, somewhat in the muscle, although these rockfishes don't store that much lipid in the muscle. Um, so we're modeling energy dynamics, right? Fat gains and losses. And so we're going to do that with a bioenergetics approach um, using those models developed by Chris Harvey. And here's where the environment is going to influence energy gains and losses. So we have temperature dependence functions where we know how temperature influences consumption rates as well as respiration rates in these fishes, which is really cool. Um, and then we're gonna also model differences in mean food in the environment. So I'm thinking about you know, differences in, in ocean productivity that vary by region. And we're also gonna model seasonality in when that food is available. So strong seasonality, where you're gonna have really high peaks, really low lows, and then weaker seasonality, such as in the South, where food is kind of you know, more persistent throughout the year. Okay, so once we determine energy gains and losses, these females are gonna take any new energy and add that to their existing reserves. And they're gonna have you know, a, a reservoir of energy that they're gonna be able to allocate either to growth or to reproduction, or just to continue to store that energy. So here's where stochastic dynamic programming comes in, because we're going to use that. We're going to find the optimal energy allocation strategy for our variable U, which is energy that's going to be used to grow bigger, and to R, which is energy that's going to be used to reproduce. And how we're going to do that is we are going to maximize V, this variable V, which is expected lifetime fitness, and we're going to use fecundity specifically as our proxy for fitness, we're going to make no assumptions about larval survival or any of that. This is based off of maternal energy reserves and reproductive output. Okay, so after a fish decides, it, decides whether to grow or not, or how much to grow, um, they can decide whether to reproduce. If they reproduce, all the stored energy goes into the gonads. And then this V term is a function of current fecundity gains from the current brood. And then any expected future fitness, which comes from the state dynamics in the next time step, also discounted by the probability of surviving to that next type step. Okay, which is S, which is a little bit lower if you decide to reproduce. So if you don't reproduce, you don't get any current fitness games, but you do get you know, some expectation about surviving to the next time step. And then also like maybe you, you grow a little bit bigger or you gain more fat and you can make you know, more eggs in the next time step, right? And then at the end of the month, we're gonna just update all our reserves, say, hey, does this fish have enough to avoid starvation? And then also we have this stochastic mortality process that there's a risk of, of mortality every month. And so does this fish survive, say, predation every month? So that is how our model is set up. And then kind of more of the specifics of how stochastic dynamic programming work is that we're actually gonna work back through, backwards through time. So in the very last time step, we know that all future fitness is going to be zero, right? The fish dies, there's no more future fitness. And then we're gonna work backward to solve for the combination of U, that's energy to growth, and R, energy to reproduction, that maximizes V, our expected lifetime fecundity, for every single possible and impossible combinations of length and energy and time. So at the end, you come up with these, these decision matrices that have like 18 million options for what a fish should do given its length, given its energy reserves, and uh, you know its age. And then from there, how we're going to visualize this is we're going to use a forward simulation of an individual at the age and size of recruitment to the maximum age. Okay, so this fish is not going to die. It's going to live through the whole lifespan. And we're going to do this to visualize these adaptive life strategies for these different environmental conditions. Okay, and so for this model, I'm going to introduce you to you uh, the rosy rockfish. It is a species capable of multiple broods. And we're parameterizing this model for rosy rockfish because we've worked with them in the lab. We know a little bit about what they do in the field. They're broadly distributed throughout the California current. And we're gonna use the biology of the species to set some limits on this model, okay? Such as maximum size, they're pretty small. Um, lifespan, they live about 35 years. And then I just wanna make it clear that growth and reproduction are emergent properties of this model, but the biology sets kind of some constraints. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is sort of this experimental design. So conditions vary through space in the California current, and we're gonna set up some different temperature scenarios, and I'm gonna focus really on temperatures that differ from 
uh, Southern California, where they're a little bit warmer throughout the year. Um, and this is how they vary in Southern California, where um, at the depths where we collect the rosy rockfish. And then I'm going to compare that to temperature conditions that vary throughout the year in Central California, because these are really the two regions that I have the most data on about rosy rockfish. Okay, and then within those two temperature regimes, we are gonna model differences in the mean food uh, um, in the environment affecting female uh, feeding success. So these high, medium, and low food environments. And then within each of those environments, we're gonna model differences in the strength of seasonality of when that food occurs and the feeding success and fat accumulation of females. So we're gonna do that with the sinusoidal feeding function. And um, if you wanna know how this relates back to um, the California current, so we have this hypothesis that seasonality is pretty weak in the, in the South, um, but actually, and food conditions are low, so it'd be more like this low food example over here. And then in the Central and Northern regions, you see stronger seasonality, right? And maybe greater food resources. So we have this sort of experimental design to, to tease apart um, the effects of the environment on reproduction in fishes. Okay, and how, what are we basing seasonality off of? because I don't have, you know, great information, um, but I do know how seasonal fat reserves cycle throughout the year in some of these species. And in general, these fat reserves, they really peak in October and November and their lowest kind of you know, late winter, early, um, early spring, so after the fish reproduce. And this is just a general pattern across most of these shelf rock fishes. So they have low energy reserves in the spring and they, they peak in the fall. So that's what I've based those environmental condition scenarios off of. And let's take a look at the results. So I have a couple slides of results and then we're gonna wrap up here. But some of the cool results that come out of this model, again, growth and reproduction are emergent properties of this model based on state dependence and bioenergetics. And the, me the major influence of the mean food in the environment, so basically differences in ocean productivity, influences growth and expected lifetime egg production. So, for example, in high food environments, females are expected to grow much faster and to a much larger size, okay, than in these low food environments. Seasonality does not have much of an effect on growth patterns. So what this means is that these large fish in these high food environments, their brood sizes are just, you know, massive compared to these poor small females in, in poor food environments. And what this means in terms of expected lifetime fecundity is that females that are in these high food environments have, you know, they're expected to produce millions more larvae than um, a female in a low food environment over the course of their lifetime. Okay, so those are expected growth patterns that come out of differences in mean food in the environment. So what I thought was really cool to come out of this model was that seasonality and when that food is available influences the timing and frequency of reproduction in these fishes. And so how this works, these are plots of mean energy reserves, again, in kilojoules, but just think about this in terms of, you know, grams of fat throughout the year. And in these strongly seasonal environments, so this is, you know, uh, high food, medium food, and low food scenarios, they are gonna, you know, fluctuate greatly in these strong seasonally, seasonal environments, and then less so in these weak seasonal, seasonal environments. So what that does is that we come up with this scenario that strong seasonality favors single broods over the entire lifespan of a fish. So here, what you're looking at, um, strong seasonality is these, these squares here that I've, I've highlighted in gray. So once the fish matures, they really, they only produce single broods, no matter what are the feeding conditions through the expected lifespan, except for the very last month of life or the very, very last year of life where they just dump everything into reproduction. And what comes out of this is that these moderate and weak seasonality environments favor multiple broods. And this kind of depends on the amount of food in the environment. So we see some multiple brooding in high food, a little bit more in medium food, but really these low food environments is where you would expect to see females multiple brooding because that increases their expected lifetime fitness, their expected lifetime uh, fecundity by producing multiple broods. So it's an adaptive strategy. And so what's interesting also based off of these energy dynamics that we're modeling is strong seasonality favors the shorter winter reproductive season. Okay, and again, I've highlighted that in gray for these different levels of mean food. And so females in strongly seasonal environments, they're really only produce, reproducing in the months of December, January, or, Fem or February. But in these moderate or weekly seasonal, seasonal environments, that actually favors you know, multiple brooding that occurs outside of this winter peak. So these are these, these broods that occur outside of that winter brood. Peak. And so that's really favoring a longer reproductive season as an adaptive strategy. 
Okay, so temperature did not have a strong influence on this model, but again, we were modeling temperature as well within physiological tolerance limits, um, you know, in the depths that, that these fish occur. And, but there is a slight influence of temperature. And so these, what you're looking at are temperature performance curves for rockfishes, and these are the different temperature ranges that we modeled. So this modifies respiration rates and modifies consumption rates. And so that's influencing the bioenergetics. So we did find in these warmer water environments, so warmer compared to cooler environments, uh, these warmer environments did favor slightly greater more reproduction outside of that winter peak. So here's you know, less, less brooding outside of that winter peak in cool environments and then more in the warm environment. All right, so takeaways from this modeling project are environmental conditions influence the variation of adaptive reproductive strategies, right? These strategies are emerge because they maximize expected lifetime fitness given the environment. And so this is, you know, an explanation for why spatial traits vary, uh, you know, across space in the California current. And so things that we saw are that in the south where temperatures are warmer, where productivity is less and where seasonality is weaker, that favors multiple brooding as an adaptive strategy for those fish to, you know, produce as many eggs as possible over their lifetime. Um, and so just main takeaways are, you know, ocean productivity is probably going to influence expected growth patterns, which is something I wasn't focused on, but came out of the model. Um, we also actually see that in the wild. So I think this was a study by the Northwest Fishery Science Center where they looked at um, growth patterns of some rock fishes and other ground fishes, and they found you know, larger size fish in more productive habitats, which was interesting. Um, but also, you know, just the expected reproductive potential is going to vary greatly depending on the ocean environment and productivity. And then seasonality is really going to set the timing and frequency of reproduction in these rock fishes. So that is like a really cool aspect of this model. And then temperature, you know, it influences bioenergetics. So you could make some, you know, hypotheses about how more extreme temperatures may influence adaptive strategies. Um, but we just modeled within the physiological tolerance limits. So lastly, kind of some considerations some food for thought that maternal condition is an endogenous driver of the timing, frequency, and amount of reproduction. So you can think of this in terms of fishes that are like capital breeders versus income breeders, you know, the importance of energy dynamics in those capital breeders. You can also think about this in terms of maternal condition maybe influencing recruitment patterns, right? So we've seen how, how uh, reproduction can vary year to year depending on, on maternal condition and how that might actually even influence recruitment patterns. So maternal energetics influence adaptive reproductive patterns. That's what we've shown through the math. This is even without considering other exogenous selective pressures such as larval survival rates, right? So these larvae are being born in the middle of winter. I don't know what they're eating. <laughs> so this actually sets up, you know, a potential maternal offspring conflict in when larvae should be reproduced or when larvae should be released into the environment, which is super interesting to think about. And, you know, maybe this live bearing strategy, these fish, you know, they produce live larvae, they provision these larvae with energy resources. Maybe that's to kind of overcome some of this, this conflict. Okay, so ideas just to think about uh, throwing out for the future. So some final thoughts, um, hopefully I've shown you today or uh, convinced you that there is temporal and spatial variation of reproductive traits for these rock fishes of the California current ecosystem. And then hopefully I've shown you through the modeling why variation in life history traits is to be expected, right? It's to be expected in order for these fish to maximize egg production. Uh, this is especially true for species with distributions across different environmental conditions or conditions that change through time, even though my model is not focusing on that, it's fo focusing on spatial differences. So phenotypic plasticity of reproductive traits is adaptive to maximize egg production in different environments. And then also lastly, I'll just say state-dependent modeling is a powerful tool to understand how and why life history traits vary. Uh, so I think if we, you know, modeled a more northern species, such as the yellow eye rockfish, we'd probably see more instances of skip spawning and, and understand why that's occurring. It can also be used for other species in different ecosystems. So I based this model actually off of an Atlantic cod model, um, where that model actually predicted about 30% of the mature females should uh, skip spawn every year as an adaptive strategy, and they actually went out into the wild and saw that. Um, so these models are really powerful. Okay, and then to wrap up, I'm just going to give a little teaser 
So there is a workshop coming up next May in the Northeast. Um, it's going to be a joint workshop from the National Stock Assessment Working Group, so folks working on population dynamics, and MARVELS, which is a reproductive ecology working group as part of NOAA and other institutions. And we're going to have a joint session to talk about spatial modeling and life history traits that vary through space. So if you're interested in this and want to talk more, I highly recommend coming to um, this workshop. Okay, and then I have, obviously there's so many people involved in this project, I can't name them all, but I thank my funding sources, as well as all the interns that have helped me throughout the years to count rockfish, eggs, and larvae. And with that, I will um, take any questions, and here's my email if you'd like to contact me after, um, and I hope that you've enjoyed the talk. Wow, thank you, Sabrina. Very impressive work. Um, so people are welcome at this point to unmute themselves and uh, ask questions directly to Sabrina. I do not see any questions that are in the chat. Um, I was wondering, you know, at what stage are you? Oh, we do have a hand raised. Yes, Ian Taylor. Nice job. Um, that was awesome. It was a lot of information and I don't think I absorbed even half of it. So forgive me if I missed something. Uh, but I'm curious for, you know, you, you have this annual time series for a bunch of species in the first part of the talk of, of, you know, sort of high and low kind of years. H have you looked at the stock assessments for those stocks, those that have them to see if this correlations with the estimated recruitment time series? Uh. So in these stock assessments, um, we what we model in these stock assessments are uh, the fecundity size relationships. Uh, so that is put in, but they do not vary through year. So that is not a part of any assessment that I know of for West Coast rock fishes. Oh no, no, yeah, absolutely. No, I'm thinking more like what is estimated is oh this year was a good year class, and this year there was a bad one, and we always assume that sort of just. The environment, but yeah. in fact, you know, the phenotypic yeah. plasticity might be a big driver of that. So, yeah, I, you know, I'm curious. It would uh, be useful to see how much of that variability in estimated yeah. recruitment, independent of any, you know, real, you know, fecundity data, is, is lined up with what you estimate. Yeah. So I'm glad you're picking up on that because that is something that I think about a lot. Um, and I think about, you know, a lot. A lot of times we think about year classes being set by larval survival dynamics. But really, in these rockfishes, you know, they are producing millions and millions more larvae if the conditions are good, and then just like they're really, you know, taking that back during bad conditions. And I, you know, even skip spawning, you know, you're not even going to have some females contributing. So that has not been looked at at all. Um, some of the, you know, we do have this awesome time series. It is, you know, unfortunately, for, unfortunately, it's only from one single tiny little population in Central California. So how that ramps up to a bigger uh, coastwide stock assessment would be a little bit, you know, challenging to make some of those assumptions, but we could try to look at that. And I know that, or what I think um, happens is that some of these multiple rooting species, such as chili pepper and boccaccio, actually have a lot more, um, like, stochasticity in those in those year classes. So they have, they do have those really strong year classes that come through once in a while, like that 1999, like super strong chili pepper and boccaccio year class. And what's interesting to think about is that it's the multiple brooding species that seem to have kind of those 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 really strong year classes that come through. And what if that's because these fish are doing multiple broods and that's just, you know, a year where there's like so much more larvae in the water and they're surviving a little bit better and that's maybe driving these recruitment dynamics. Um, there's a lot of unanswered questions there. Um, that, you know, I would love to look at in, in the future. And I did highlight, there was one study that Friedland uh, 2021 study, I forget what species, I think it was haddock, but they were able to look at differences in maternal body condition, the reproductive output, and they were able to tie that to recruitment dynamics. Um, so that would be the next step, right? How could, you know, does this matter for recruitment? And that would be, you know, important for, for stock assessments for sure. So things to talk about in the future, future projects. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, I do see we have a question in the chat. It's from Kiva. She says, lots of cool work and really nice talk. Thanks for sharing. 
In the first study, how do you know that the differences in interannual variability in brood size are driven by life history and not sample size, i.e., if sample size is low, won't each year's estimates shrink to the mean, making interannual variability low? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I think that is true, right? If we have low sample sizes and they're like the data is not super informative, uh, yes, it would kind of shrink back to that mean. But because we see such large differences, I almost look at it from a different perspective that we see these large differences like as the data is really supporting those differences and they're very large, right? So, um, so it, it is true, maybe I am underestimating a little bit um, in terms of interannual differences, but they are large. <laughs> they are really large. I want to make that point fairly clear, and it is really those large females where we see the most differences. Um, I, I like this modeling framework because there's a lot that goes into developing the fecundity length relationship, and you're right, sample size is really important, but also, the range and size of females that you collect is also really important. Um, so this Bayesian hierarchical framework, it really helps rein that in. Say if you're getting you know, a year where you have just kind of like small females, but you can kind of estimate that intercept a little bit better, um, and then you know, draw from what is the expected maternal size effect based off of that kind of uh, the population level estimate. So I think it's really, I like, I really like the modeling strategy of that framework because it's to me, yes, maybe it is a little bit more conservative, but it's, you know, the differences that you're seeing are, they're really there and the data is really driving those differences. Um, but I'd be, I'd love to talk more about that. Um, so open to other ideas too. So I definitely would love to follow up on that. Okay, and then also in the chat from Mark Winchell. Uh, great talk. Just wondering if you have considered food availability in relation to population size, like same species or similar density, uh, density dependent competition in the model. Yeah, so that is a great question, and uh, we haven't we haven't looked at that because that time series again it's the the population this one population at Cordell Bank. And I don't, I'd have to ask John Field if he has some ideas on how we could do like some density dependence estimates. So we could have density dependence estimates from the stock assessment, which again is coastwide. Um, but really, you know, when I when we get into the state dependent modeling, you're absolutely right. I'm modeling, you know, the feeding success of an individual, right? So there could be a lot of food in the environment, but there's a lot of individuals. Obviously, you'd have density dependent factors, and the feeding success of you know per capita feeding success would be much lower. So that is, um, I'm not quite sure how to how to tackle that in the time series. We could look at you know stock dynamics through time. Um, I would say at Cordell Bank, um, it, it has been unfished for many years. It's part of a national marine sanctuary, and the density is high <laughs> of these species. So it's it's not a fish population. There's there's lots of fish here. So density dependence is definitely going to be a factor. How that has changed through from the 1980s to 2019. I'm not quite sure, but um, I would be curious if you have thoughts on like how we might be able to, to tease that apart. Um, I can also, you know, talk a little bit more with our stock assessment scientists and, and see if there would be a, you know, kind of an estimate of population abundance there that we could link, but that would be, you know, really cool. Um, but I will put, I will say one thing, you know, a benefit of collecting body condition data is that that is going to be reflective of the per capita or the individual feeding success of an individual, right? And so there might be something there in that body condition data that tells you, you know, how individuals are feeding, you know, versus overall conditions in the environment. And I do kind of see that in the model. Like sometimes I'm like, oh, that was a really good year. Why aren't the fish in like such good condition? And why aren't they producing more? But it's maybe because of density dependent factors. Good question. Okay, and I apologize for missing if people have their hand raised and I ignored them. Um, I see David Boughton and EJ have their hands raised. Would either of you like to unmute and ask a question? I think EJ's had his hand up longer. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I just put it in the in the chat actually, but um, I was just thinking, it was a great talk, by the way. I, I was just thinking about um, if I understood correctly, you were seeing increases in both growth and brood size in the good years, right? 
as a function or over time, basically, was there a positive correlation between growth and root size? No, there wasn't. Um, so I think I think you're just mixing up the first part of the talk and the second part of the talk. So the first part of the talk, I have maternal length right in the model, but mm -hmm. I don't make any expectations on like differences in mean size by year. It's just like the size is a covariate in that model. Right. Um, well, I was wondering then, in your, well, maybe from your SDP, I, I, what I was trying to think about was how you might uh, get a proxy for good years, whereas if growth is also increased, and then, then you could use like growth increment information to sort of hindcast uh, time series of good reproductive success. It's, it was just something might be interesting to look at, because uh, I know we don't have data for all of the years and all the species that we'd like, but if there was a relationship there, it might be helpful. Yeah, so that is a, that's a really cool question, EJ, and I think that would be, you know, part of that modeling effort. Um, so you would expect in, you know, differences in growth based off of the habit, based off of the ocean conditions. So that is definitely an expectation of the model. So that would be cool if you could look at different growth increments through year. Um, obviously that the energy dynamics are trading off with you yeah. know, growth and reproduction. So that is a you know a little bit more complicated, but you could you could look at that versus you know small fish maybe that aren't re reproducing and those that are. Right. Um, so I think, yeah, that's another component where you could kind of piece together what the conditions were for kind of individuals that were experiencing in different years, you know, along with that body condition data. But you're right, if you don't have body condition data, what are you gonna do? And looking at um, differences in growth patterns could be really cool. Thanks. We've hit the top of the hour, but uh, David, thank you for your patience. Do you wanna make this the final question before we cut off the seminar and end the recording? Yeah, thanks. That was really fabulous talk, Sabrina. Really fascinating, a lot to take in. So I, I thought the um, result that from the uh, from the stochastic model was interesting that lower food availability leads to multiple broods, really counterintuitive. Can you give us some insight of that? Is that and would that be related to this whole hyper allometry pattern? Um, let's see. I, I yeah, the effects of, of big females in that model. Um, I haven't thought about as much, but a couple of things. So seasonality really drives the multiple brooding patterns. So it's really those, you know, weak, uh, weakly seasonal environments such as that occur in the South. Um, really by, by doing multiple brooding, it's because those fish are expected to be a little bit smaller. And by doing the multiple broods, you know, they, they have to get a certain amount of energy to make a brood and then, you know, making multiple broods throughout the year um, is a way for them to increase their reproductive output in that environment. Overall, that reproductive output is going to be much lower than uh, a high food environment. Um, but differences in, yeah, that low food, I th it's just, it's all related to the energy dynamics. And so even in the low food environments, you know, seasonality is, is, is a little bit different because you're, the fluctuations between the low food and the high food are, are a little bit different. The amplitude in, in energy fluctuations is a little bit different. And so I, I think that's why you're seeing these small fish and that they have to produce, you know, broods throughout the year to maximize, um, that's just the strategy to maximize their, their reproductive effort in those low food environments. Um, I will say in terms of um, size, in each of the different environmental scenarios, it is mostly the older, larger females that will produce multiple broods. Although that low food environment, they start pre producing multiple broods pretty quickly. And some of that actually even might tie in, what, what I didn't show is there are slight differences in expected survival in those different environments. So those fish in low productivity environments um, that have weak seasonality, uh, they might not be expected to survive quite as long, so they gotta start reproducing a lot more earlier on. Um, but yes, but there, there, some of the components that come out of the model is that it is mainly the older, larger females doing the multiple broods, except for those, you know, really poor productivity environments that maybe, you know, survival might be a bit different. They gotta, they just gotta ramp out eggs as fast as they can. Um, and they're smaller, so they do small broods more often. Yeah, I see. That, yeah, yeah. Does that kind of answer your question or do you have some thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, no, that, that makes sense that if their risk of mortality is higher than they wanna reproduce more often and sooner.
Okay, well, thank you for that final question, David, and thank you, Sabrina, for a very engaging seminar. Um, we are over time, but if anyone still has questions, please reach out directly to Sabrina. And um, thank you, everyone, for attending, and hope to see you next week. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for coming.